please welcome to the stage Priscilla Ware. Hello, Traverse City. Before you is Priscilla Were, a Kenyan, to announce to you and to the whole world that my country is sick. My country is suffering from three ailments, tribalism, corruption, and impunity. But in the same breath, I announce to you that the Kenyans have been brave enough to acknowledge that they are sick. And we have also discovered the cure. At independence, we were full of joy because we conceived a free, fair, and prosperous Kenya. In the same breath, three of the independence heroes had the same conception. The first gentleman there, Johnston Kamau Kenyatta, who later became our founding president. At the height of the freedom struggle, he was tested by the colonial government and told, denounce the armed wing of the struggle and we will make you the first prime minister. He rose above personal interests and declined. Then they went to the second one, Adonija Ajuma, who later became Jaramogi Oginga Odinga, and told him all you need to do is denounce Kenyatta and you will be the first prime minister. He rose above tribal interests and declined. And you know what, my friends? Adonija's tribe is the second largest. Kenyatta's tribe is the first largest. Their wives, Gina, Maria, must have also been part and parcel of that maturity. Then there came the towering gentleman the first canon of the Anglican church in Kenya, the African one. In 1959, at the height of the struggle for independence, the governor visited the western part of Kenya, populated by the third largest tribe. And he was asked to pray. And you know the governor represented Her Majesty the Queen. And the Queen is the head of the Anglican Church. So he prayed. And at the end, he made a definite, deliberate statement. He said, God, help the Britons to realize that you gave us Kenya as you gave them Britain. And they should leave us alone. Do you think he was, just hold on, hold on. Do you think he was arrested? No, he was praying. And what do you think the governor said? Amen, which means let it be so. And so we got our independence. But lo and behold, a desire came to the decision makers. A desire to choose only familiar faces into positions of decision making, particularly decision making about dividing resources. While we were still shocked, it became, you get a position, it is your time to eat. While we are still shocked, corruption came in. You give me something, then I appoint you, ladies and gentlemen. All our problems in our country emanate 
from these two. And now they have taken on a second powerful ailment called impunity. You hear statements like, we will do. What will you do to us? But ladies and gentlemen, it is not that we have not tried to slay the dragon. We have tried. We have set up commission upon commission. It does not work. And presently, we are now burying people. Cause of the dead, the three. For example, every five years, we go for elections. And at every election, particularly from 1997, tribe rises against another tribe. 2007 was the worst. We almost disintegrated. We butchered each other. If the UN had not come, I would not be here. Last week, just before I came, neighboring tri tribes inhabiting neighboring villages, in one night, one tribe butchered 60 people, majority of them, the sick, the pregnant women, those who are keeping their children close to their bosom, and the lame. But that is not all. In the month of April, we buried 147 undergraduates of one university, butchered in one night. Invest investigations are revealing that the assailants bribed their way as they came in. But don't be depressed. Don't be depressed. Kenya has discovered a cure. The founder of this cure, the value education system, she is a graduate of the African traditional education and a practitioner too. This is an education that reign on values. And so she set up a pilot school, Butere High School. And in that school, what she did was simply ask the members of the school, what do you think Kenya is suffering from? And they listed it. Everybody knows them. I believe even the fetus knows because the mother suffers. And so they came up with this. And how can we live in order to eradicate? They came up with this. This was step one. Now how is it inculcated? Ladies and gentlemen, when the new students come, this is a high school, ranging between 13 and 18. When new students come, they are introduced to this model, and they suffer from shock, because they have left a background of rules, regulations, and prefect positions. And so, after the shock, the first thing that we do, we win them, W-E-N, forgive my African English. Make them realize that they can transcend from the prefect system and school rules to growing, to nurturing, and to living the values. And how do we do it? We set up deliberate debates. In those debates, they're encouraged to research, to speak, until 
Kiswahili as they speak we use the two languages the official language which is English and the national language which is Kiswahili and this is done twice a week and they begin to weigh the options through one topic of debate to another topic of debate the second stage we do what is called thawing and melting away the myths the stereotypes about people and facts and how do we do this we have set up a room for research so the young girls are encouraged to go in and read and they're just reading on the knowledge on the information of what they learn they begin to appreciate the importance of knowledge they begin to move away from ignorance because it is ignorance that the peddlers of tribal feelings use so they learn the power of knowledge and as they learn the power of knowledge two things happen they begin to perform well in academics so they get confused number two, they become confident because they have something to say they can talk in class they discover that there is so much democratic space they begin to grow an image number two. We encourage them to do a lot of reading. We have a lot of books that are written by Kenyans. They begin to discover as they get into the book that this author who comes from that tribe can say something good. This author who comes from the enemy tribe is also good this author who comes from that tribe can offer us something and so they go on reading and reading and two things happen ladies and gentlemen they grow their analytical skills they also begin to grow their critical skills they begin to realize that there is a difference between myths which are the vehicle of tribalism there is a difference between myth facts and truth and they sort them out the third area of throwing and melting stereotypes is the current affairs we encourage them to read the newspapers and our newspapers on any day three quarters of the information is about the miseries that are caused by the three and so they are encouraged to read the newspapers to listen to the electronic media pick the information and they are encouraged to hold dialogues and discussions because when a new student comes is normally given an older student to be a mentor and so in the compound they will be talking to each other i read this what do you think about this and sometimes even when they meet a teacher like me they say mwalimu have you read this just before i came a form a first year student confronted me and said do you know when the 147 undergraduates died three were from my clan and here you are telling us we should love other tribes i told her that's a very valid question but do you know if we don't stop tribalism even your children your grandchildren your great grandchildren will bury and bury and bury and she told me 
I think you are right. It, it, just hold on. It makes them project the anger to the right enemy. Apart from throwing away and melting away of stereotypes, there is this idea that the teacher and the learner and the worker in the school are partaking of the same values. And it makes the child feel, I am important. I am loved. I am respected. For example, every morning we have an assembly. And sometimes I think because of my old age, I arrive late. <laughs> so when I arrive and they have started, and it's the students who are doing it, I stand outside and wait. Then after that, I walk in and the first thing I do, it is not an apology, no. I ask them to forgive me because I have ruined the morning assembly and they have the authority and the pleasure to tell me you are all right. And that makes these children feel important. But that is not all. Two weeks before I came here, a student told me, in the presence of others, do you know grandmother? That's how they call me. <laughs> do you know grandmother? You are letting down your integrity ratio. I said, how? Oh, how have I done it? They said, last time, you promised that anybody who would get an A in the exam we were doing, you will award. I had forgotten. So I said, I'm sorry, tomorrow I will. So the following day, I arrived with the prizes. They were not very big. But you know, it's the heart. But this girl, the students are concerned that I should not lose my integrity. So all of us have reached a level of growing integrity. But that's not all. There is a last area, and this is the area of innovation, creativity, and proactivity. Value education works on those ones. As somebody picks a value and places it in their life, they begin to grow. So what now? All there is is to bring students from all tribes, bring them here, they conceive values, they go and give birth at home and come back. The next one bring schools from other places, they come here, conceive values, and go back. Then we may save our country. Thank you very much.